And hello, and welcome everyone to another installment of the Comic Multiverse, where the worlds of nerd meet. You could be anywhere in the world right now, Matt. You could even be watching the big sports ball game, but instead you're here on a Sunday night with us, and we greatly appreciate it. Cheers to you. I'm, I, I'm sure that all the people are only tuned in, all the people that we, we, we uh, talk to tuned in for the trailers and then tuned oh, out. Oh, of course. Oh, of course. That's a sport in and of itself. Now, I never watch a sport, but I'm going to make sports <laughs> food, bar food, and I'm going to sit here and I'm going to watch for the trailers. In fact, uh, I didn't put it on our list of topics, but uh, yeah, we saw the Falcon uh, Winter Soldier uh, trailer before we started, so I'm sure we'll talk about that. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> the chat saying, what nerds watch sports? Hybrid nerds, the Captain Kun. <laughs> they multiclassed into sports nerd and regular nerd. <laughs> That's how it happened. <laughs> the type uh, of people that play Madden. Absolutely. And FIFA. Or fantasy uh, sports in general, which is basically just Dungeons and Dragons, but with sports. Big fans of the league. <laughs> yeah. So how have you been, Matt? Not too bad. Not too bad. It's been really, really, really hot here lately. Has it? It's been freezing yeah. over here. <laughs> Ain't that always the way? Yeah. I, uh, I've been all right. I actually tried to do a little streaming on my own channel earlier today, and it failed horribly. If you're one of those people who showed up to that one and basically saw me have a freaking meltdown, I apologize for that one. <laughs> it was the worst thing because I was trying to work my mouse, and I was trying to work my controller while having restream in the corner so I could read comments, and I could play it, but the chat window kept going away every time. Uh, and I'm like, well, what the fuck is the point of playing if I can't read the comments? That's the whole reason I'm streaming. If not, I would just play, you know, by myself and everything. I got those two new classes on Vermintide I wanted to uh, try out. Oh, nice. Man, Vermintide, I've, I've never been a big Warhammer person, but Vermintide 2 has turned into, like, one of my favorite games to play online because it is just endlessly replayable. That's awesome. They just announced um, Warhammer 3. Um, yes. Yes. Uh, not too long ago and i'm really excited about that i love the the, the strategy warhammer games they're so mm. much fun and dark tide which is basically mm -hmm. like vermin tide only in the regular warhammer timeline not like the uh what is it medieval warhammer mm -hmm. timeline we might have to check that out it's kind of like left for dead but in the warhammer universe we might have to co-op that definitely yeah, that would definitely be something to play. So, again, sorry for my fuck up there, everyone. I'm going to try and do it again tomorrow because it's like, oh, I can't let this beat me. I don't know what it says about my personality either that, like, big earth-shattering setbacks do nothing for me. I'm like, meh, what can you do? Just move on, glass half full, da 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 da, -da. But little tiny things cause me to pull my freaking hair out. I don't know why. Well, it, as well, it's, it's, it's also a lot of the, the, like, setup's fault as well. Sometimes it's mm. not as intuitive as you would assume it is yeah and it's shit i've done a million times before mm -hmm. yeah that's the thing that really gets me i'm like i knew this worked before i went back and <laughs> looked at old videos and i know it happened before <laughs> uh but yeah everyone we got a big show for you this week uh we promise we got a ton of different news topics to cover and hey be sure to stick around in the second half of the show because we got kyle higgins on and we're going to be talking to him about his brand new image series radiant black as well as just a bunch of other really fun topics it was nice to uh get to talk to him again in fact uh, ooh, uh him and image have allowed us to actually do a giveaway this week so if you want to win yourself a ooh. copy of radiant black issue number one then in the comment section down below someone tell me in uh kyle higgins's other big original creator owned series uh cowl it was a super team and it was also an acronym what does cowl stand for <laughs> And the first two people I see who tell me that, uh, I'll give them the code. So, you know, thank you to Kyle Higgins for that. Uh, thank you to Kat over at Image there, who, uh, again, I, I never get review copies of anything, and then suddenly they sent me two review copies of oh, nice. uh, Radiant Black. So they, they knew I was an easy lay for this shit. <laughs> <laughs> and they were right. In fact, by the time this show goes up on Wednesday morning, which is the day Radiant Black drops officially, mm -hmm. yeah. my early review will have gone on Monday. Monday, which is tomorrow awesome welcome welcome to the life of a freaking youtuber where i gotta think in like three dimensional time well i gotta get this out before the release but they'll play that 40 40 chess yeah it's 40 chess all the time every time i'm so tired i just want to sleep <laughs> <laughs> so there you go everyone mm. 
Now, with that, once uh, we've gotten the regular show intro, once we've talked about our giveaway, uh, we can pay the bills. Let's go to the bill pill, uh, paying section, Matt, where we talk about our sponsor for this week. And, oh, boy, I'm so happy about this week's sponsor, Matt. I'm wearing the shirt right now. And, you know, sometimes ad copy is just a joy to read, and this is definitely one of it. Because, you know, I like to think, Matt, we have an intimate relationship between ourselves and the audience. And, you know, I I care about you guys out there, and women, too, because I think like 8% of our, uh, what is it, viewership is Roughly, yeah. (laughs) Roughly. But, you know, I, I care about you all out there so much. I care about how you're living. I care about how you're doing. And these are tough times we're in, in these quarantines. It's really easy to let yourself go to hell. I know. I was eating meatball sandwiches with everything. I was having gravy all the time. But, you know, I'm back on keto now. I'm taking care of my body. And another way you take care of your body, Matt, is how you take care of the downstairs. If you know what I'm saying. <laughs> how you take care of stuff below the belt line. And our new friends over at Manscaped, again, I'm wearing the shirt, want to help you take care of everything downstairs <laughs> with their brand new manscaped razor 3.0 this is the lawnmower i actually had the 2.0 they had given to me Mm. before as part of another deal and uh, for the first time ever you can actually get manscaped products in canada so they were very nice to send me their brand new product this is state-of-the-art ceramic razor so quiet it's really good it's really the, the light on it is very handy i've got the i've got the exact same one See, exactly. We know what it's all about. Ergonomic, sleek design. Looks like Batman made this shit. And with, you know, technology and parts so advanced, even Iron Man would shave his balls with these. And now you can too. And it's waterproof as well. You can use it in the shower. Waterproof, amazing battery life. This new model actually has a stand, which the old one did not. So that's super awesome. So what I'm saying is, you know, take control of your life, take care of yourself, take care of grooming with Manscaped. And you know what? They offer a ton of other products, too. They got the plow. They've got crop dusting, you know, basically deodorant for your balls. And I mean, who doesn't want that? They also have brand new for the first time ever space age material underwear, which I may or may not be wearing right now. I I was about to say, I'm. I am wearing them at the moment. I knew we were doing this, so I put them on. (laughs) Hey, there you go. It's no chafe. It's no sweat. They may actually be the most comfortable pair of underwear I've ever owned. I really wish I could get more than one pair at at any time, but you have to pay for them one at a time. (laughs) They're really nice. But hey, you know what, Matt? We can actually help the fans out with that paying part. If you go over to their website right now and use the promo code JOEL20, you can get 20% off your first order as well as free shipping which is pretty great it's pretty good so i'm just saying manscaped do it for yourself do it for (laughs) your partner do it for the comic multiverse your balls will thank you eh? (laughs) god i was so happy we got to do that ad read (laughs) also because this is like russian roulette with youtube's content stuff where it's like how how long can i talk about balls and shaving balls before (laughs) they get us in trouble i wonder (laughs) This, uh, this also makes us feel like a real big boy show, too, because all the other big boy podcasts got Manscaped sponsorships. Yeah, there you go, Mr. L says, but he doesn't believe us, so we need to show show us your balls, Joe. Show, <laughs> show us your balls. <laughs> Ooh, that's for Comic Multiverse After Hours. <laughs> <laughs> yes, inject that money right into the scrot. Exactly, Zeke. Uh, for real, too, they were really transparent with the thing. They're like, hey, if you send enough people our way, from this you know obviously we gave you the device but if you keep sending people our way we will actually start giving you a cut of this thing so if people like this and people support this we can talk about shaving balls every week on the comic multiverse (laughs) it's gonna be wild bill soda shaving balls (laughs) that will be our new thing now joel's balls are patreon exclusive i think that's got to be only fans exclusive but yes if it keeps going then yes (laughs) Yes, show your Canadian pride, Jade. You can shave anything in there. Moose, you know, the rush symbol. <laughs> you can put everything in there. Uh, and on that note, everyone, we can officially head into the news this week. And there actually is a nice little smattering of topics, isn't there, Matt? There is, yes. I guess let's start with the newest thing, which is the Falcon Winter Soldier trailer that dropped right before we actually began. Mm-hmm. Uh, it looks really cool. Again, it was short. It was only like two minutes. 
Yeah, no way. I expected only like a 30 second TV spot, but not a full full trailer. It's coming out way sooner than we thought it was, too. It's coming out in March. Yeah, yeah. It, well, I think there's like a week between WandaVision finishing and Winter Soldier starting. That's so smart from Mandalorian to WandaVision to Falcon Winter Soldier. Yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> That's such freaking smart marketing on their part. And man, uh, this looks good. Again, this looks like they're going full buddy cop because obviously, you know, despite what some people will tell you about all superhero movies being the same thematically and structure wise. No, this one looks to be going pure in the comedically mismatched uh, buddy cop direction yeah and it works so well here in as well with these two characters that they, they look like they're having a lot of fun it the action and it looks really great that that they're, they're basing a lot of these trailers around that uh fight on the semi trailer yeah which looks really really cool yeah we get to see zemo a little bit more in this trailer confirming that yes he will be one of what is potentially many villains and yes he has the purple mask the mask, we... the mask. and it looks great it does. It looks exactly like it should. And he gets the quote of the trailer, you know, uh, basically talking about, you know, finishing old business. Yeah, it's a continuation of his storyline from uh, Civil War, basically. Which is which is great. And we knew they had to do something with that character because they didn't kill him off. They arrested him and made a point of actually putting him away. Now, I wonder, like, because obviously he's like, es- he's like escaped somehow. I wonder if maybe they'll use the, the blip uh to do that like he he got he got uh snapped out of existence and then when he came back five years later wherever he was being imprisoned wasn't there anymore or something that's an interesting idea i like that a lot i i had worked on the theory too that you know uh zemo thunderbolts i kept waiting for the moment that thunderbolt ross let him out because he's like yes i too also hate superheroes let us form a team and put that could be one that could definitely be, I could see that happening. Especially if we're getting, like, a Hulk-centric show in the next little bit, mm-hmm. that would be something. Because yep. so far, in WandaVision, we haven't seen it yet, but I wonder if all these shows will also have, like, an end game, like a thing that they're all building up to in a Connected little nugget. To. Yeah. Yeah. Like, it's harder to pick out in WandaVision, because WandaVision is so, like, out of the box and so weird every week, but I wonder, is there a little nugget we're supposed to be picking up on? Well, I think it might, like, for that, I think it just might be, like, sword. True. Like, sword just being, like, that thing that goes from from everything and sort of connects right. it all together. and Yeah, our, our new shield, essentially, there. Mm-hmm. Uh, also, too, the concepts of multiverses, maybe, as we saw at the end of this week's new episode. Maybe, but I don't, I don't know yet. I think it's a red herring. It's obviously I... a red herring. I think it is, too. I think there's many, many layers on that one that have yet to be seen. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so uh, the Falcon Winter Soldier trailer. Ooh, the other big thing, freaking Agent 13. Yeah, she got a really cool scene in this trailer. and looks like they're actually going to be doing something with her character. Wow, about goddamn time that they picked up on her story again, because she showed up for a minute there, and what was it, Civil War? And it's like, oh, that's cool. And then we never saw her again. <laughs> I wonder if they're going to explain a way like Steve kind of ditching her to, to yeah. go and hang out in the past with her her aunt. Yeah, I wonder if they're going to explain that too. And also, seemingly that like Steve changed all of time and lived a life with Peggy and everything. Does that mean Sharon might be like a blood relative now or something? Yeah, I don't know whether they'll touch on that in this series. That's that sounds like they something they touch on with like doctor strange or something something a bit more like to do with the yeah. multiverse yeah because that just brings up a ton of things where it's like wait wait what a minute what <laughs> but no I, I love she gets to be in something because it's like yeah sharon carter is cool from the comics too i'm glad she gets a yeah. moment here i'm glad she gets to be in something yeah there there were in in the in the trailer that there is um some scenes that people are thinking that might be maybe steve rogers's funeral oh there's like there's like a big picture of steve in the captain america costume and there's like people in uh army uniforms like dress uniform and 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 falcons in a black suit could could be yeah that would be something Hmm. open the show with that the death captain america that would be pretty huge that would definitely uh what is it blow people's minds and also too for chris evans to be like no i swear i'm not actually coming back yet wink wink (laughs) not coming back so soon nah 
And again, this is comic books. That's that's when you know these movies and TV shows have reached the point when they do their first big The Return of blank. Yeah. Like, oh, look, The Return of Tony Stark Iron Man. We paid him like a billion dollars and he got to come back. <laughs> Or we let him, or we, or like we let Chris Evans direct one of these, and he came back. That'll probably be something that'll bring them back. They get, they get to direct or write or or something. something. Yeah, they got something on the back end for it. Yeah, which hey, I'm fine with. I'm fine with that. But uh, yeah, so that trailer looked really freaking cool, and we're gonna get to be seeing it before we even know. Very soon. Yeah, yeah it's gonna be here any moment. No word on Black Widow though. That's still in the works. Well, they've they're not um. Well, they've they're committing to that uh, releasing in May. Mm, we'll May? see something. Yeah, again, we'll see. But I think they're pretty adamant that it goes to cinemas. We we said it before, and I think it's going to remain to be true. This idea where it's like, yo, we have these shows. We don't need to release a new movie. We're just going to keep it banked for when movie theaters do eventually get to open up again. And then how cool will it be to have a Marvel's Avenger movie ready to go? Well, there's that. But then there's also the fact that, like, how does it tie? Like, is it an integral part of Phase 4? Like, do you need to see it to understand something that's going to be happening mm-hmm. in something that was meant to come out after it or something? Or True enough. I mean, I think it's only integral in like, hey, okay, let's say goodbye to Black Widow now, everyone, and also maybe plant the seeds for her sister to also mm-hmm. be the new blonde Black Widow. Yeah. Good old blonde widow. So yeah, there's that news for you, everyone. But hey, we're not done with Marvel Cinematic Universe news because some pictures leaked from the set of uh, Thor Love and Thunder this week as well. They did. It got started filming down here in Australia. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, ooh, everyone's got some new and updated costumes. Perhaps the most interesting is, of course, Thor himself with the whole leather sleeveless vest and jeans. Very similar to friggin' Thunderstrike. Thunderstrike, yeah. And he's actually wearing his comic-accurate uh, Thor boots as well. The yellow, yeah. the ones with, like, the yellow wraps around them. Yeah, how about that? Man, I love all this time later they can still put interesting little costume notes there and little references to the comics. Yeah. Also, too, we're seeing him hanging out with Star-Lord still, so again, we still might actually get a little taste of as Guardians of the Galaxy in this. I th- yeah, oh, I think they're going to be in a lot of the film, a lot more than what people assume. Yeah, yeah, Because, I mean, it worked for Thor Ragnarok so well, right? To have yeah. Thor have a buddy. Mm-hmm someone to have him bounce off of so yeah i mean this this looks really cool and also too ooh, he's not holding the hammer in this one he's holding something else yeah he's holding stormbreaker and uh, he's got long hair again and he's not uh fat thor no yeah interesting interesting so it'll be it'll be kind of cool to see you know where we find our characters and how the you know development and evolution that happened in endgame is still happening mm-hmm so that's definitely cool. It w- would have been nice if they could have uh, snapped a picture of uh, Gore, too. I would have liked to have seen that. Oh, he's, he's going to be CGI. It'll so well, just be it just be Christian Bale in a little tight uh, onesie <laughs> thing that they do for the CGI. <laughs> you mean you don't want to see that? <laughs> <laughs> Him just yelling at Thor, Oh, well, da-da-da-da-da, King of Thunder. <laughs> It's a professional production, former <laughs> King of Thunder. That's what I want. They're like, just just yell at Thor the same way you yelled at that lighting guy. That's yeah. what Gore's character's going to be. <laughs> oh, gods, look at you, so high and mighty. <laughs> How would I come down there and slap the hammer out of your hand? <laughs> that's what we need, just him yelling all the time well that's the thing christian about like we say it was going to be cgi but he actually turned himself into gore <laughs> he's such a method actor he lost all that weight he was also willing to become an alien space monster <laughs> he's like look i trained and i studied to become the most militant atheist in all of the cosmos <laughs> i just care about it that much also, too, we haven't seen what Natalie uh, Portman is going to look like in the costume yet. That'll be interesting. No, we've seen pictures of her. She's been uh, doing like horse horse riding training. So I guess, mm. I guess, um, yeah, her Jane Foster is going to be riding a horse. So that's pretty cool. cool. I, I I wonder too, you know, because uh, c- c- the comics 
did that bit there that was always a little annoying to me because no one ever seemed to do it right. The idea that when Jane Foster became Thor, she also had to hide her identity from everyone else in the Mm -hmm. Asgardian court, which is why she wore a helmet and why she never took it off. I wonder, is that going to be a thing here or not? Yeah, I I don't know. Because, I mean, maybe, I mean, maybe they could because... Like he doesn't like Thor doesn't have Mjolnir because it doesn't technically exist in this timeline because mm. Steve took it back in time with him to put it back where it originally belonged. Yeah, yeah. So if someone does just like turn up with Mjolnir and it's it's Jane, but she's like in the helmet, there's that mystery, right? That right. that we ex comic fans know, but like the general audience doesn't know. Yeah, it's it's funny because again, the comics never did anything with that either because she never took the helmet off when Jason Aaron was writing it. She took it off in the Mark Wade run, even though I don't think she was supposed to. And they never answered the question where it's like, okay, so does Jane Thor just look like blonde Jane, or does she look like someone completely different in the way like when Donald Blake becomes Thor, he looked like a completely different dude? Yeah, I know they, um, that maybe they will they'll explain it or they just won't bother. They just won't. Again, that's another thing. People always spend so much time thinking and wondering, like, oh, what could it mean? What could the answer be? A lot of the time, it's just easier to not give an answer. Yeah. A lot of the times, it's easier to just be like, don't think about it. (laughs) And this feels like one of those. So, uh, yeah, there's your Thor Love and Thunder update. Looking good. Yeah. Now, continuing on the Marvel Comics front, uh, we got a lot more news coming out of Heroes Reborn, which I will freely admit when we talked about it on the show, I was not that interested in Heroes Reborn after the initial pitch, but I got a lot more excited when I actually saw the little trailer that they did. When I saw the little trailer, as well as the creative teams that were announced for some of these books. Yeah, that made me do a complete 180 on it, where I'm like, okay, this might actually be interesting now. Because when I originally saw Heroes Reborn, I'm like, oh, we're doing another warps again? You know, what if characters are fused together? Oh, that doesn't sound that interesting. But as the trailer explained it, no, 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 no. This is a world where the Avengers never existed, but everything in the Marvel Universe more or less happened the same. And the only one who can seem to remember what's going on is Blade, because, of course, Blade has actually been a focal point of... Of Aaron's last Avengers. Yeah, yeah, he's been a, a really big part of that team uh, since what the first issue. He was he was in like the first arc, or yeah, came since, in like, in the, the first arc somewhere. Yeah, since like the Vampire Nation stuff. Which hey, yeah. having like a big event like this and having Blade be the focal point of it and have <laughs> it not involve vampires, I'm like, all right, that's pretty good. Yeah, expanding his reach. Yeah, I can uh, I can deal with that, and uh, we got a bunch of books in front of us that are, we're actually going to get a chance to read as part of the event that are spinning out of it. We have The Siege Society, which is basically a combination of the Masters of Evil and the Thunderbolts. I like Baron Zemo looks exactly the same, because of course he would, because he predates the Avengers. Mm-hmm. He was like an actual Baron in World War II. Mm-hmm. And uh, ooh, I I love the saber tooth design they got on this one. This is one of my favorite looking saber tooths. It is. It does look pretty good. We also have, and this is the really interesting part of the book: Hawkeye, Black Widow, and Scott Lang, Ant Man. The idea being that if there was no Avengers, they wouldn't have become heroes. They would have stayed villains. Yeah. And I guess the Scarlet Witch they got there too, but their take on the Scarlet Witch, which is kind of a fusion. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Of, like, Jean Grey and Scarlet Witch. So, all right, that looks pretty good. It does, yeah. I'm kind of down for that. Then we got uh, the amazing Shutterbug, which is just just Peter Parker is a photographer by the looks of it. Yeah, yeah. The story is he just doesn't get bitten by the radioactive spider, and he's just a photographer who... He's basically Jimmy Olsen, pretty much. Yeah. Oh, as the chat is telling me, uh, Mark uh, Bernadin, who wrote this, he's uh, one of the guys from Fat Man on Batman. Really? I didn't know that. Oh, nice. Awesome. I I knew the name sounded familiar, but didn't know where he was from. Okay, so he's a fucking podcaster like us. Good good on you, buddy. More more power to you. If you get work, hopefully that means we'll get work one of these days. (laughs) Actually, speaking of, did you see uh, the comic story? He's actually going to be writing a bloodshot uh, backup for Valiant. Yeah, good for him. I, I know Benny's been trying to make that happen for a while, actually, so I'm glad that actually ended up happening for him. Good good, good for you, man. Golf golf claps for you. Good shit. But yeah, I like the idea of this. In a world, Peter Parker just stayed Peter Parker. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I imagine and I imagine it'll be uh, like, a, like a very, like, from his point of view, kind of 
uh, what's that? Is the series Marvels? Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. Very yeah, much yeah. like that, where it's from just like a normal guy's point of view. Yeah. Then we got Hyperion and the Imperial Guard. The idea is is that like even the Squadron Supreme broke in two during Civil War because while there was no Avengers, the Squadron Supreme, basically the DC hero stand-ins, ended up being the main heroes of this universe. Mm-hmm. Which again, I'm sure will play into Coulson and Mephisto and all this mm-hmm. other stuff that I was really annoyed Aaron didn't tell us about, but now is getting blown up into a whole event. Oh, absolutely! This is absolutely like Mephisto's doing somehow. <laughs> Yeah, so apparently uh, Hyperion took one part of the team, and then I'm guessing, uh, what is it, who's uh, who's their Batman guy again? Uh, Nighthawk. Uh, Nighthawk, who's very cool and has a good costume. Basically, I, I think he fucked off to Europe and started another chapter of the team. <laughs> so we got two different versions of the team, and I'm like, all right, that's pretty slick, that's pretty cool, and also, hey... We're trying to make Hyperion happen again because if DC and Warner Brothers keeps dropping the ball with their Superman, we might have to do our own Superman. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm loving the uh, the attention Hyperion's been getting lately. It's great. <laughs> so yeah, that uh, that one's looking pretty cool. And then we have Magneto and the Mutant Force. Yeah, is it Magneto who is basically Professor X. Yeah, all right. I mean, they've definitely toyed around with this idea before. I wonder. Are we going to get to see a lot of Krakoa tie into this? Are we going to see some references there? Or is this like a whole new thing? Yeah, did Krakoa change? All yeah, exactly. Did they still get to Krakoa, but it's totally different? Yeah, or, or maybe they changed it around and it's like the, with the two islands split, Arako stayed and Krakoa went into the, the other world. Oh, that's good, man. That's a good pitch, yeah. actually. I like that. If Matt's right about that, you all owe him a Coke, actually. (laughs) In the same way you all owe me a Coke for knowing that when Quicksilver showed up on uh, WandaVision, he would be Balky, you know, crazy European cousin. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, the last and probably the one that interests me the most is the Young Squadron. Basically, what if the champions took their reference from the Squadron Supreme instead of from the Avengers? And, oh, look, Jim Sub is back writing this, everybody. (laughs) Took a while, but he finally got to come back to this, which, you know, I'm super fucking stoked for him. And this this one in general just looks like an interesting twist on it, uh, especially because uh, we got Miles there, but Miles is now Falcon. Yeah. So this is this is cool. These are these are interesting stuff. Yeah. And uh, uh, Nova looks to be taking inspiration from uh, oh, what's the one from the Squadron Supreme team? Oh, it's they, like the Green they, Lantern uh guy yeah. stand in yeah looks like 3d man though yeah yeah 3d spectrum light man that guy yeah <laughs> but uh yeah so i got to admit uh, i was unsure about heroes reborn coming in but this this is actually a pretty decent lineup of what if books it looks pretty good yeah it does and it's funny too where it's like you know i should i should be less interested in this because we just came off future state which was also like hey let's take the books and let's flip the scripts on them and see what happens but you know when it works it works (laughs) yeah it works yeah again the companies always do something like there's a couple of years every now and then Mm. where like everything lines up like there was a couple of years ago where like the like snyder's justice league and aaron's uh avengers were basically telling the same story Yep, absolutely. Hey, you got a story with Atlantis? We got a story with Atlantis. <laughs> you got a story also, with big, weird, celestial gods from space? Well, we do as well. So do we. Uh, Dr. Spectrum, as the chat is saying, <laughs> thank you. I was confused with Monica Rambeau, who is also called Spectrum sometimes. <laughs> but yeah, so this uh, this looks like it could actually end up being pretty cool, all things considered. Yeah. That being said, you know, uh, they got they got hard uh, shoes to fill on this one because the last time they flipped the script and did like a whole universe tear down like this, it was for uh, Hickman's Secret Wars. Yeah, yeah. Secret Wars and, and then uh, uh, Secret Empire and stuff like that. I mean, Empire wasn't so much a takedown or a complete it was It was like alternate they... history sort of thing. Yeah. Well, I, I, I'm talking like when they stopped the books and called them something different. Ah, uh, yes. I suppose so, yeah. And then again, this is only, you know, this is uh, only five books. I wonder if they're going to, like, stop a bunch of books and put these out or if these are just going to be extra books on top. I feel well, it's like a line, it's like a line wide event. Like, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. like the, the actual premise of the event seems like it's line wide. Yeah, yeah. It would be weird to have these books coming out at the same time as other books. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. 
So, all right there. There's that news for you, everyone. Uh, And, hey, speaking of Future State, and we absolutely were, uh, we all knew it was only going to be a two-month thing, maybe an experiment, maybe a stopgap, maybe uh, a planting ground for new ideas. But uh, for one hero, the Future State will be continuing for a while, and that hero is, strangely enough, Red Hood. Yeah, which kind of makes sense. This book book will help distance himself from Scott (laughs) Liddell. It'll help distance him from all the Scott Labdell bullshit by jumping him in the future. It'll actually do a good job distancing him from everything else happening in the Bat Family books. Even though it's funny, they don't call it Red Hood, they just call it Future State Gotham, which I thought was interesting. Yeah, so well, it's probably going to be like a Gotham uh, yeah. anthology. Right, for a little of everything, but Red Hood definitely seems to be the star of this one, and this also furthermore answers the question, hey, how come when all these other books got to restart and got new number ones, Red Hood didn't, because Red Hood is going to be staying in the future state by the looks of it. Yeah, I I have to imagine this is also going to get explained in Infinite Frontier, like, probably maybe, because all these books seem to be spinning out of that, that that first issue, Um, so I imagine that there'll probably be a story where, I don't know, Jason Todd got stuck in the future or something. I, I mean, hey, it worked for Tim Drake. Oh, no, wait, no, it didn't. But it'll work for Jason, <laughs> though, because Jason doesn't have as much dignity, so there's less to fuck up. <laughs> and as we said, the distance is actually really, really good for him to be the focal point of something in the future. Uh, Joshua Williamson is writing this. In fact, Joshua Williamson looks to be the new Red Hood guy because mm-hmm. he's writing this. And he's going to be writing Red Hood in that Batman Urban Legends anthology mm-hmm. book. So it looks like if you want to get a taste of Red Hood, you got to go through Joshua Williamson, which I'm I'm fine with. Good choice. And the man's definitely yeah. got a voice for him, as we can see from that one future state tie-in. Yeah, so far it's been pretty good. He's, he's got a good uh, handle on the character. It's something, something new for him to do. Yeah, and uh, this will also be a continuation of those red hood backups so if you didn't read the red hood backup but are interested in this check it out yeah it it kind of felt like it had to be because there was a lot of story there that they haven't told us yet i imagine this book is going to go back and tell us yeah how how did jason forsake his family and become you know the go-to bounty hunter for the fascist police Mm -hmm. state that is the magistrate but also rise to the occasion and be better than the magistrate by not killing heroes which is actually a bit of evolution for him as a guy Mm -hmm. who as an anti-hero only killed people but then he's also paired with someone who does kill criminals Mm -hmm. and there's that moral uh dilemma for him and everything it's uh it's moral when he's sleeping with her which uh he is so it's fine (laughs) (laughs) i imagine he says it all the time god rose wilson i hate how you kill the people i'm trying to save but you sex me up good so you know we're gonna call this one even (laughs) gonna call this even z's i imagine you're being like oh i'm gonna kill him jason i'm gonna you shouldn't you shouldn't uh you know we got a date tonight so you know like i'm just gonna turn my back and you know whatever happens happens (laughs) in that way he's the most relatable he's ever been (laughs) i i get it jason we've all been in shitty relationships it's cool (laughs) but uh yeah this uh this looks really sweet again i never thought i'd say this but i'm actually super stoked to start reading red hood in urban legends and with this it looks to be pretty good it's also pretty cool too this furthermore idea where it's like oh i guess future state is popular enough that it's not going anywhere now they're actually going to be keeping it around as an imprint by the way going to be keeping around a lot of things for a lot of the people that said this was just going to be a one-off none of this is going to matter mm-hmm. like over half i was i was like looking at it and like over half the stuff that's been going on in future state is still continuing it's true and i mean some of it was shit they were going to be doing anyway like another story i had on here uh yara floor wonder girl gonna be getting a solo series there i mean obviously they were ready to rock with that character because she was getting a cw show and Mm -hmm. everything else but uh, uh some of these other things i think was just good fan response yeah yeah i i think a lot of it is well i think i i think they had the stories and they're like okay we'll see and we'll just wait the fans like it we'll put it out if not we'll maybe sit on them for a little bit and change them up and do something with them which which we know they do because again hey friend of the show jim zub had mentioned that he wrote a suicide squad book that got sat on forever and then suddenly out of the blue they're like oh we're releasing it on digital this week yeah so again i imagine they banked a lot of stuff and when they had two months to you know kind of go back and think differently about 5g they completely changed 
the way they put these books out and how it was going to hit us. And I honestly think it changed for the better. It it worked. Yeah. Because again, and no one has either confirmed or denied this, but my theory for how 5G was supposed to be is that they would have put out these future state books, but would have called them 5G. Mm-hmm. They would have put out those generation books, but called them 5G. And then they would have put out something in the present. So you would have had past, present, and future all going simultaneously. In- and it would have Infinite been like Frontier an- would be the, f- the present stuff. There and Infinite Frontier would be the present stuff, and then it would be like, oh, pick whatever you like and follow it wherever you want to go. I truly think that that's what five G mm-hmm. was supposed to be. And for the most part, it it seems like it's still that. It's just called yeah. something different. And generations isn't continuity anymore, but whatever. I mean, everything's continuity now with the Omniverse. True enough. Did you like it? Did it sell good? Well, guess what? It's in continuity now. Yeah, and that book, and that that's still got issues coming out of that as well. I know it does. I know that's still going out. I I stopped reading it when I knew it wasn't continuity, but I might go back and finish it once it's done. <laughs> but yeah, uh, Wonder Girl, as I mentioned, it's going to be a series now. Going to be starring Yara Floor, and everyone is super stoked on it as they should be because the character is really good and the book is really good yeah and it's the same exact creative uh team Team. behind the future state book yeah creative team of one jolie jones is going to be writing it (laughs) drawing it and uh yeah that this book actually came to an end this week too it was only a two-parter which again it's some people are confused that that some of these future states are four and some are only two yeah well again it's they had a lot of these stories banked and they just decided Mm -hmm. well we'll put them put most of them in the batman books yeah, but, Batman. Uh, I think that all the got. Batman books have like four issues each. Of course, because bat supremacy, don't you know? Yeah. But uh, yeah, I, I really liked what they did with Wonder Girl here. They basically give her like a very, again, no pun intended, Greek tragedy of a backstory, you know, where she lost a sister and is trying to get her back from Hades and risking life and limb and everything. Mm-hmm. Also, again, I I wonder if there's something behind the naming, too, because obviously Yara Floor, Floor means flower. Her sister's name was Potera, which also means flower. Yeah, again, it's it's the Dragon Ball Z naming scheme where everything's named after a vegetable. (laughs) Yeah, are are all the Brazilian Amazons named after flowers or is that to denote that they're like, you know, closer than just, you know, sisters in the Amazonian sense of like, oh, we're all sisters. (laughs) Yeah. I also love what they did with Hades in that book where he looks like a goddamn Dark Souls boss. Yeah, Jordi Belair's colors on that were really damn cool. He's just huge and pissed off all the time. And Persephone is cool, too. She's just all sad and angelic and giving off light. Because, again, if you know anything about the story of Persephone, she's not from the underworld originally. No. And doesn't want to be there. No, I learned that from Hades. <laughs> Yeah, I know, right? Boy, does he. Also, it's cool, too, that uh, Hades in this book speaks Portuguese. Yeah, yeah. And, like, no one questions it. And I'm like, yeah, I guess if you're an ancient being, yeah, you'll learn to speak a little you Portuguese. Probably, you probably speak a lot of languages. You have to deal yeah. with a lot of different, you know, people. Yeah, when you got nothing but time there, you'll eventually pick it up. And uh, I appreciate that book, too, for, like, not being afraid to be kind of sad and bittersweet. Sad as well. And then, like, also, like, cut it in with like humor and stuff yeah uh, yara floor when talking to king minos does the oh i'm taking my thumb off <laughs> joke and that I, I i said in my review of that issue that's like kind of what sets her apart from diana because diana wouldn't do stuff like that no but they like but like yara uses it as like a defense mechanism yeah diana is always serious and regal because she's royalty and everything and she has to and she's carrying a whole people and culture on her shoulder so yeah the idea of a funny, brash, hot-headed, younger Wonder Woman. It seems like like it shouldn't work, and yet it works amazingly. Yeah, well, it works because it's got a competent team on it. That's I could see something like this happening in, like, New 52 and it just being terrible. Exactly, but again, you know, this is an art-writing team that really cares, and uh, I hope they have a very long, fruitful run because you, you're goddamn right I want to pick up Wonder Girl number one when it comes <laughs> out. How weird is that? It's like, you know, oh, there's a new Wonder Woman book. Yeah, whatever, that might not stay, but this new Wonder Girl book, <laughs> this is where it's at. 
what were some other new books we got coming out from Future State? Oh, Mr. Miracle, The Source of Freedom by Brandon Easton. This isn't going to be a full series. This is only going to be a mini. But again, we're following up with Shiloh Norman there. He got a big push in Future State. Now it's going to keep going. Yeah, people seem to like Shiloh Norman. Yeah, and some people for the first time knowing that this character exists, even though they existed mm-hmm. in like the 70s. Yeah, he's, he's a very old character. Very much so. I uh, like this story, too. They talked uh, Easton about it, and he's like, you know, I want to tell, you know, a superhero story that's, you know, fun and exciting and, you know, Jack Kirby-esque, but also, you know, a story about someone trying to thrive as a black superhero when so mm-hmm. many of the cards are stacked against you. Yep. And I'm like, all right, that sounds like an interesting And, and mix. Mr. Miracle is, like, like the perfect character for that as well. Again, you it's can escape a... everything. Yeah, you can escape everything except for this. Except racism. You can't escape that. <laughs> but what if I try really, really hard? Well, then I guess you're going to be trying really hard. <laughs> this is also, like, a new origin for the character, too, because, again, they just kind of plop the character down in future state and like expect you to know what's going on with them so this is their chance to like you know do a new origin yeah well this is like the first time he's had an origin in like a long time yeah because like if, if i do believe and correct me if i'm wrong uh shiloh was uh scott free's like apprentice yeah scott free's apprentice and um scott free's uh master's apprentice as well he was like a he's right. like a mixture yeah for- for like the magic show and everything yeah. so uh I, I wonder will we actually see scott free in this book mm. we could yeah it would be kind of fun to you know tie together all the different mr miracles where it's like you know mm-hmm. you got the new god mr miracle and then you got the other mr miracle too yeah so yeah this uh this one looks interesting this one looks like it's got a lot of potential on it yeah it does and his, his future state book so far has been pretty good this little story Absolutely. in future state though it was weird that they decided to put two of the parts around out of order out of the for some reason i don't know why yeah i don't get that either also too i was not a fan of that superman of metropolis final issue i didn't i wasn't crazy really? about that i really liked it i thought they rushed them like but, but there's still like so many things left here that you well, just kind of gloss over again it was it's the whole thing it's like this book is probably more issues but they had to give them to batman or something uh, n- never has anything felt like it should have had four issues and it only got two because like there's so many huge leaps there from like okay we defeated brain cells but we're keeping brain cells alive because i'm no longer a threat to metropolis okay i've defeated the literal you know uh what is it or the metaphorical ghosts of my father but have realized that i need to actually think smaller than superman and i need to only concentrate on saving metropolis he literally only becomes the superman of metropolis in the last page and, well that's what i that's what i liked about it that that's yeah. what i i like that he didn't just immediately it's like oh he's superman down no it, it happened right at the end of the story and you don't get to see the end of it and even to the concept of like a Superman that only protects Metropolis and, you know, only does one thing, uh, assumedly also giving up a personal life because like we never see what John's home life is like in this book. And I it wonder doesn't if doesn't look ever like will. he has one. No, which is like kind of sad, but also like I, I keep reading that like that's interesting. Like, how does that weigh on him? Hey, maybe we'll get something in Infinite Frontier. They still books yeah. they haven't announced that's true that's true they still have it and also super sun's being collected too which is also nice Mm -hmm. so yeah there's uh some more future state stuff for you but hey we got some more marvel stuff coming down the pipeline too fantastic four life story by mark russell yes immediate pickup immediate yeah for me same 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 you you loved what they did with spider-man telling his story throughout the ages and now we're going to be doing it with the first family of marvel really i think the only other group of characters that they could like it literally goes spider-man and then fantastic four because they've been around that long been involved in so many stories and it would be interesting to see how they get updated through the eras yeah yeah as well as correct me if i'm wrong but this is actually going to be yeah an updated origin for them yes so uh, yes, again yes, yes. again just in time for the movie yeah isn't that nice isn't that good uh now because again there's just so many iconic moments from fantastic four history that are also iconic moments from marvel history and man to see this actually tied in with like real history is going to be so cool yeah I, I love it when the when comics do that like the ultimates do that all the time um but yeah I, i'm intrigued to see what 
Mark Russell will do with it because Mark Russell has has a very particular uh, writing yes. style. He's very uh, he's like political comedy and like yes. satire and all that sort of stuff. So is it is it going to play into that? Like, is it going to be like oh, a satire of like sixties like space race stuff? I mean, that's definitely what the first issue has got to be. The first issue has got to be in the 60s. It's got to be about the space race. we got to beat the Ruskies now, everybody. we got to get to the moon. Yeah. How about about you, Richard's family? Do you want to go to the moon for America? Yeah, I I, I hope it's exactly like that. (laughs) And they're like, yeah, sure, whatever. And then I guess, you know, we can get into the 70s and everything. You know, we'll have to do the first Galactus story. And we'll have to do mm-hmm. the, like, okay, when did they start fighting Doctor Doom? And then, you know, later on we can do a Nihilus. And maybe even we can do, like, their shitty costume versions when, like, Sue decides, <laughs> like, well, I'm going to be evil now. <laughs> I guess, too, once they get further along, they would also have to do, like, the death of Johnny, maybe, if they get that yeah. far. Yeah, oh, I, I imagine they're going to get that far. I imagine it's going to come right up until modern day, like today, present day. Like Spider-Man did, which yeah. that's when it gets a lot harder, too. Where it's like, I guess I guess you do the kids. I guess you do the kids growing up mm-hmm. into adults, and I guess maybe let Sue and Reed actually get old. Yeah. Let them be geriatric, maybe let one of them die. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Who do you think would be the first to die, Reed or Sue? Reed. Yeah. Which is maybe like better, because <laughs> I think if Sue died first, Reed just, like, couldn't handle it. No. He'd, like, go freaking crazy. Although, in saying that, that, that that would lead to, like, a pretty cool, like, you could do, like, a pretty cool story with, like, Reed and Namor with that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, they gotta do something with Namor here. Maybe yeah. they meet Namor in, like, the, what is it, in, like, the swinging 80s or something <laughs> like that. Wouldn't that be cool? And he's dressed like Miami Vice and everything. <laughs> Ah, there's so many places they could go with this story. Oh, and, you know, you'd have to do the thing in Alicia Masters and maybe, Mm -hmm. like, their relationship because they finally got married after all these years of will they, won't they. Yeah. Yeah, the Council of Reeds. I would like to see the Council of Reeds be something in this, too, because that was a big defining moment for them as well. I think it's, like, the last time people really were excited about the book. The the setup of the Illuminati. Yeah, oh god yeah yeah does that mean we'll get to see other heroes yeah. i mean we got to see a lot of other heroes in the spider-man book so it would reason to guess yeah that we would get to see this one too w- w- would we see other big events in here because the fantastic four during the civil war were kind of pulled apart they were yeah also to oh yeah herbie we got to get herbie the dumb robot <laughs> in here too somewhere you're absolutely right. the future foundation yeah that's for sure they got to work the future foundation in there somewhere yeah I, oh i'm sure i'm sure they they thought about all of this stuff all of this stuff that's going to be in there yeah i'm sure we'll be endlessly surprised by the stuff there oh th- they should work black panther in there too because his big appearance was in a fantastic four story yeah do you think they'll work the fan uh, like uh spider-man like him trying out for the fantastic oh, yeah. four into it and then relate that, it back to the life story the spider-man life story stuff that would be funny i don't think these are meant to be in the same universe but yeah they gotta work that in somewhere <laughs> even just as a joke for reed to be like get the hell off my lawn young man <laughs> yeah the inhumans i'd like to see mark russell's take on the inhumans mm-hmm <laughs> Man, so much, like, big important shit spun out of the pages of Fantastic Four. First family, man. Yeah, like, the book itself isn't so much like, oh, this is a must-read, you gotta read it, but at the same time, it's like, dude, so much of what you love in Marvel spun out of here. Yeah, yeah, it was, it, which is why it's so, like, crazy that, like, the book never gets, like, pushed as much as it should. No, they did for a little bit when mm-hmm. Dan Slott came on, and then it just kind of well, stopped. Yeah, that's when, the, that's when, the, when they actually came back after uh, yeah. Secret Wars. Yeah, I, I I think you just need like another Hickman there. You need like someone mm-hmm. to like completely blow up the concept. Yeah, maybe this will they, do it. This will might do it. Maybe I don't know if they want anyone to blow up the concept right now when they're so close to the movie where it's like no no preserve them in amber for what we got to do next. <laughs> Again, we don't need to be shaking it up. We don't need to be doing a new Fantastic Four. <laughs> we got to keep it nice and safe at least until the movie is done. <laughs> Uh, and with that, that's all the news we had for this week. So a nice smattering of topics. Yeah. Uh, obviously, of course, I have that interview for the latter half of the show. But before we sign off, uh, anything you want to talk about, Matt? Any books that you uh, had just had to talk about? Um, let me actually just have a look at like what books did actually come out throughout this week. It's hard to keep track, isn't it? 
It is, yeah. I know we had like a pretty great Venom issue. Yes, yes, we did. Uh, Donny Cates continues to do great on Venom, which I love because usually when a big all-encompassing event spins out of the pages of something, the original book suffers. That's not happening here. Venom is still very must-read. Yeah, it's, and, and it, I'm surprised at like how uh, connected it is up to King in Black in terms of it like, really is. like you can easily place when things are happening because like half of this book is half of what happened in King in Black, but mm-hmm. we see it from Eddie's point of view. Yes, I, I feel disappointed for people who came in and are only reading King in Black because you really are only getting half the story. Yeah. Also, what a beautiful love letter to Flash Thompson. Donny Cates is sitting here yeah. trying to break bread between the Eddie Venom fans and the Flash Venom <laughs> fans and be like, no, we are all brothers. Look, come and break bread. <laughs> and he left it in a place where we could get Flash back as, as like a Venom because the, they left it kind of i imagine they'll do it more in the king and black actual uh yeah. stories but like it's left ambiguous whether he actually got out of back to earth as like an actual person yeah yeah they left uh that open for interpretation which i'm definitely cool with and you know what furthermore uh donny cates if if we never saw flash again and this was him dying for real uh cates gave him a better death than slot did a better more heroic death it did i i have a feeling though he's going to be alive it's going to be one of those situations where like oh we've defeated no all the all the all the uh symbiotes are like going away and the streets are like clearing and everything and they'll find like flash's body or something or something like that well because again as we've set up in venom the end and what eddie's plan i think originally was hey the symbiotes when they're supercharged enough can actually recreate physical matter Mm -hmm. so all they would need is like for the venom suit to be like all right plopped out a new eddie or uh, plopped out a new flash you know here i just implanted his codex into his head so he's good yeah like like dylan has to do that Mm because dylan has the power of the codexes you know dylan ascends to like level 100 it's like now i can create life itself (laughs) (laughs) for i am a god child (laughs) Hey, here's an interesting thing. You know who they didn't find in that symbiote world? Who's that? Uh, Dylan's mother, Annie. Mm. I really thought they were going to see her there because it's like, yeah, because she was dead, right? Or maybe she wasn't. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, maybe she's one of those one one of those people that uh, 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 Noel had captured in the in those cages in the, in the Quite in possible. the real hell. Because they keep making references to Annie, and we saw the alternate Annie Mm -hmm. when they went to that other universe. I keep thinking that she's going to be, like, the last page. Like, oh, yeah, fuck it, and I'm back, too. I I like to – I have a theory that, like, Noel's keeping her as, like, a a last weapon Uh, against Eddie. Like, that's the only thing that will stop him. Like a human shield, like he pulls her out at the very end. Yeah. Also, too, we have this whole thing, uh, the light. The light is coming, you know, the the alternate – of whatever Null is. If Null is the great darkness, this thing is the great light. What if that's Annie? What if they explain it that way? That could be, but I interpreted that to just be like Silver Surfer. Mm, maybe. Because, so, cause, uh, well, the Black Surfer. Because, um, like, through th- that was in the in the previous issue, uh, where, like, all of the narration you find out was uh, Norrin Rad as he's right. heading towards Earth, and he's the uh, apparently the only one who can break through the, the shield. The uh, symbiote shield. Now, my theory was he's the only one who can break through it, but he's breaking through it for whatever he's a the herald. light is. Yeah. He's a herald of the light even now when he's all dark and everything. Yeah, I could see that, yeah. Again, I, I still think Donny Cates has yet to play. Like, he's got a couple cards still left to play. <laughs> you, you've activated my trap card. <laughs> but yeah, that's uh, that's some cool shit. Uh, anything else you want to talk about? Anything else big? Uh, what do we got? What do we got? Do you want to talk about the next Batman issue three? Yeah, sure. Let's uh check this one out. This uh this one was brief but interesting because we don't actually spend a lot of time with Jason. This one we actually get to spend some time with a lot of other people in Gotham and see how they're reacting to the magistrate, which I appreciated. Yeah, a lot a lot of his family and how the magistrate is uh kind of pulling them apart because uh, his parents both have differing views on what the magistrate should be doing with this fire uh shoot on site order mm-hmm. uh, where his, his mother wants it to happen lucius doesn't particularly want to get involved even though he is involved because he's him and wayne enterprises <laughs> are like selling weapons to them it's it's funny they're both ultimately pro magistrate but pro in different ways that yeah. make them fight and it's like very very sad 
and like Lucius even says later, oh yeah, dad was never the same after Punchline's attack on him. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, oh, that's a heartbreaker. Yeah. And uh, even too, where his sister's like, are you Batman? If you're Batman, you gotta tell me that you're Batman. <laughs> I like no, to think all these, all these like things are like red herrings, and it's gotta be revealed Luke is the is the Batman. I know we've seen we've seen uh, Tim in the costume, but I can't help but feel that like somehow they're gonna pull a red herring on us. <laughs> They, they were both batman they've been trading off yeah they've been using Capt- yeah where one gets captured the other one takes over or something to, to, well again you know that's that was bruce's problem he was just one man so when he was killed it ruined everything or seemingly killed but if we have two batmen in two places at once then they can never <laughs> catch us <laughs> which man that's actually kind of an interesting idea a hero that's actually two people so they can never be caught it completely does away with the whole secret identity problem that most of them have yeah yeah yeah, that's uh, that's interesting. <clears throat> also, too, you know, we see uh, a, a real focal point of the next Batman is Jace and his relationship to Justice and how is Justice dispensed in this shitty dystopian world where, like, mercenaries shoot on sight and everything. Yeah, I, I, I like that he still wants to try and and give these people a fair try. I like that he's, he's still intent. He's not trying to get them away from the city or like may mm-hmm. uh, help them escape or anything. He, he, he definitely wants them to go to jail, but he wants yeah. them to have a fair trial. Doesn't want them to be murdered in the street. And, you know, he says there, you, you surrendered to me, which means, you know, you're my responsibility, mm-hmm. which is very nice and like kind of cool. And also very different. I think than Bruce, where I think Bruce was totally okay. Just being like, yep, tying up for the cops leaving now. Yeah. Yeah. Like, Jace takes much more of an interest. And also, too, uh, e- e- even the criminals he's, you know, dealing with in this issue are shocked, you know, when he takes off his armor and it's like, oh, you got a lot of scars on you. Is that from fighting the magistrate? No, I had those already. Yeah, I I, did, I, I was tortured for a living. I, again, hint, hints at his past, which are really yeah, interesting. Where I'm, yeah, I'm like, what the fuck job did you have before? <laughs> I know he was in the army, but that's, like, all we've heard. Is he, like, a test dummy or something? He's, like, testing out new interrogation techniques on or something? Or something. I don't know. Again, it's, like, one line of dialogue that implies, like, so much. Yeah. I We're going to get that in that new Batman book as well. Yeah, that Second Son book, of course, which, you know, I, I'm more interested now than ever to check that out. Yeah. Uh, Space Lord saying, did we read the other history of the DC Universe? I have it. It's very long. I have uh, Radiant Black coming out tomorrow. I'm going to read it tomorrow. It looks good, but again, it's like digging into a prose novel because it's yeah, very I, long. Yeah, I've read half of it, and it, it is really fucking good. It's it's almost as better as the first issue. It's so damn good. That's high praise because that first one was really good. That was so where I'm like, damn, I wish more uh, Black Label books were like this. Yeah. I think it actually earns the name Black Label, you know, for being the way it is, for being smart Absolutely. and deep and a, little, and a little darker and a little bit more serious and a little bit more adult. Yep. So, uh, yeah, that was the next Batman, you know, pretty, pretty cool. Yeah, the backup stories as well were really great with Duke actually being made important and yes. given, like, a good story. As a cinema review, it's always these, like, uh, alternate universes or, like, what-ifs or possible futures where Duke has has excelled he's excelled in white knight in uh that tales for the dark multiverse thing and now this one and that's so weird yeah it's just so weird that it's just all like his alternate futures or alternate reality versions are so much better than the actual version of him what's up with that and all it took was giving him a big anime sword and a fucking stand made of lightning (laughs) I would love to have been in the writer's room when they pitched that. So what do you got for Duke? Uh, we make him more anime, like 90% more anime. Yeah, it was sold. <laughs> yeah, sold. Love it. Everything about it. <laughs> and Duke forms a new anime team of other heroes with anime-esque <laughs> powers. I got one guy who pilots a giant robot. I got a girl who also goes through a magical transformation. It's pretty dope. It's my new team. <laughs> That's that's what the new Outsiders is. That's what Outsiders 2021 is. <laughs> I, I'd be fine with that. I know. Outsiders. Now it's anime. <laughs> <laughs> and we just get that thing there of uh, the Studio Ghibli guy anime was a mistake. <laughs> that's their first villain anime was a mistake guy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I know who that guy is, everyone. But still, uh, 
but yeah, so Future State continues to chug along. A lot of fun. Uh, oh, Marauders had a tie-in to King and Black, actually, that is really more of a Marauder story than a King and Black story, but pretty good, too. That sounds like a lot of these tie-ins. <laughs> <laughs> where they're just yeah. like we'll slap as the king in black logo on the front cover and it, it'll it sell like a couple of hundred more issues well it's funny because this one wasn't like a regular tie-in like it wasn't the next issue of marauders it's like oh king in black marauders number one i'm like oh so this gets a special one shot to itself interesting they all do i think i think oh, i think really? venom is like the only one that's like actual like numbered because it like mm. we had black cat issue one and uh, uh valkyries issue one and all that sort of stuff right right i haven't read that yet but i'm hearing good things about that mm-hmm. also to uh what is it Gw- uh spider gwen versus carnage which is i think the only three-parter yep so there's something for you uh yeah i mean i guess we've talked for over an hour now and we got about 40 minutes worth of interview there so should we start uh wrapping down this part of the show yeah why not all right, so thank you so much for coming and hanging out with us here, everyone, on the Sunday night. We really appreciate it. Again, be sure to use that promo code. Get yourself some Manscaped. <laughs> Again, if you know the answer to that Cal trivia question, tell me down in the comment section below, and you too could win yourself a copy of Radiant Black, the hot new image series from Kyle Higgins that everyone is very, very excited for. Yeah, very excited to start reading that on uh, Wednesday. Yes, and if you want to know more about Radiant Black and Kyle Higgins, well, you should stick around because I have an interview with the man himself that we'll be cutting over to right now. (laughs) And hello and welcome, everyone, to another installment of the Comic Multiverse Interview Edition. And oh boy, did I manage to snag myself a hell of a guest this week, everyone. He's a writer. You know him from his work on Cowl, uh, the currently ongoing Ultraman book, and of course, uh, breathing fresh, fresh life into the Power Rangers franchise. It's Kyle Higgins, everybody. Hey, how's it going, man? What what are you what are you calling this now? Part oh, the comic well, Yeah, that's right, man. You haven't man, so Kyle and you I were, go way, you way were, back. You were you were taped Joel Daly. I still am. That's the channel name, but the show is the comic multiverse, is the show I do with Matt. You didn't even have video last time we talked. I know, man. See, I was trying to figure that out, actually. So Kyle and I go way, way back, everyone. He was one of the very first people in comics who ever took pity on me and talked to me back when I worked at Name Redacted many, many years ago. And yeah, we didn't have video. We have come so many leaps and bounds by then. This is this is kind of like coming home again to get a chance to talk to you again. This is, this is really cool. <laughs> Thanks for making time for me. I appreciate it. Yeah sure my pleasure man yeah we uh we've been boosters of each other's career for a very long time i think i i I talked to you the last time we did like an actual interview piece together god was it like it was 2014 it was like right right when nightwing in the new 52 was wrapping up yeah uh i remember doing it because i had just turned in my for my last issue like less than an hour uh, before you and I ended up getting on Skype. Yes. So it was like all very like kind of like wistful, very kind of, yeah, prominent. It was like right there. And then on top of that, thinking back on it now, like I wrote issues in that chair that I was sitting in for that. Cause I was, I was in my parents' house. So, you know, when Obviously, I've written like way more in Los Angeles because that's where I live. But like, I can remember every single thing I ever wrote, like at my parents' house, because mm. I'm just there so infrequently because they live yeah. in Illinois and I live in California. But I remember, like, wow, I can I can remember sitting at that exact spot, yeah, at that table, writing issues on that book. Then I can remember going back, sitting at that table, writing stuff in college, and then I can also remember going back. And sitting at that table and applying for an internship at the Donner's company, like in that exact spot. (laughs) And the fact that something like that, college, the superhero movie I was doing, like I kind of, I wrote it at that table, at that kitchen table. Fast forward all those years to like, you know, I was basically fired off Nightwing and writing the final script in the exact same spot. Um, I've never really thought about that before, but that's that was the context for then we yes. ended up doing like a big interview. I remember yeah, um, that that was the circumstances we met under for the first time, and it stuck with me all this time later. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's um, 
look, everything's connected. Um, but, uh, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. So I, rem- I do, I remember doing the interview for sure. It, it was Christmas time. You had had a couple celebratory drinks there, and I think I impressed you because I guessed what the twist was going to be in uh, Batman Beyond uh, 2.0, and that uh, blew you away. I guessed what the twist was going to be. Oh, the Dick Grayson. Um, yes. Being the voice in the cowl the whole, the whole time? No, not even that. The stuff with Barbara and that it was going to all tie back to old wounds and everything. I guessed that and really impressed you. I think your actual words were, who told you? <laughs> Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. That, uh, that storyline. Um, yeah, it's funny. Like <clears throat> every once, every once in a while, someone will, will tag me on social media or bring, bring up the Batman Beyond comics. And it's, it's strange because I'm really, really proud of that run. I loved it. Um, but like the stuff with Barbara, it, it, it's it's I have this weird kind of like feeling about it. Like I wish I could have it back. Like I wish I could do it differently. Really? But not because I don't. Yeah. It, but it's strange. It's like I stand by it as a story. It makes sense. But just well, that's the thing. Just because it works as a story and it iterates off of what had been established in the show mm. doesn't doesn't mean that it's a story you necessarily need to tell. You know? right. so like i i have this weird kind of feeling about it where i a lot it's like i would have never gone into that territory to begin with had the show not done it like the show established it and i was looking for some sort of big kind of um absolutely moment yeah um but but it's it's one of those things that like every once in a while it'll pop back up where like um there are people who really really don't like that I wrote that story. Right. <laughs> because I think it confirmed what was in the back of a lot of fans' heads. Because I know even me, just in my uh, like own sense of fan, I'm like, something had to happen, something really bad that split them apart. I bet it was yeah. Barbara. And then for this story to confirm, yeah, it was. And it might actually have been worse than you thought. <laughs> yeah, like, if, if it were Kyle right now, mm. writing Batman Beyond 2.0, I wouldn't write that story. Interesting, interesting. But, but that's not but it, but it's only because I think I would look at that story and go, well, that's what is the obvious thing because mm. it's kind of low hanging fruit, right. you know, as far as what would split that group apart. And it's like ah, I can do something better than that is how I would kind of look at it now. Yeah. Um, so, so again, it's weird. I have like I have complicated feelings about it because I mm, I, I love that run, but I don't talk about the Batman Beyond stuff all that much uh, anymore because they I did it I did it whenever it was 2014, 2015, mm-hmm. and then just like made that all disappear. And Dan Jurgens did it for DC proper continuity, I guess, and they ran that book forever. I know. So I feel like my stuff isn't. Like there's nothing you can even you can't even go backwards to find it in in the numbering order. It's like a a weird little pocket version that you'd have to know exists in order to find it. I I, I evangelize it to anyone who will listen. I'm like, look, you want what feels like a real continuation of Batman Beyond? Check this one out. Which again, no offense to the fans of the Jurgens, right? I know lots of people in my fan base dig it, but you know, it's just not for me. It felt yeah. too different. Felt like it went off on a whole other trend itself but uh yeah like like i said it's fun to have you here it's fun to reminisce yeah. about stuff past and everything how how have you been in this time and in these crazy crazy well i guess a year now with pandemic and shifting everything yeah i'm i'm hanging in there like it's ups and downs like anybody um i'm just i'm working a lot and that's kind of the only thing i have going on mm. <laughs> so i can um, relate yeah, yeah. I mean, <clears throat> it's um, too much work for not enough money is the <laughs> the name of the game. Uh, but that's comics also. So um, I, I, I feel fortunate creatively to have as much going on as I do. Um, it's a little little overwhelming at times. Mm. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on in the background here right now. Right, right. But. Um, it's all cool stuff and stuff I'm 
excited about and, and have been working a long time on. So the fact that it's kind of all coming to fruition in the exact same moment is it's cool. It's not ideal from a, mm. um, from a workload standpoint, but from a momentum standpoint, it, it could be really cool. So. Nice. That's that's good to hear. Let me let me ask you this because this is something I think myself sure. and a lot of other comic book YouTubers can really only theorize about. But I'm dying to get your opinion as someone who's inside the industry. What what did it look like inside the comic book industry for those two months? when no books were coming out from anyone in that really like terrifying time period? <clears throat> well, it was very scary. Um, we didn't know what was going on. I mean, depending on kind of who you talk to in the industry, um, it, it was pretty unclear who was going to be able to keep paying freelancers. Mm. Um, even on the creator owned side, you know, there was there were one or two books or projects I had that it was like, ah, uh, we can do one more issue of this and then we have to like kill it. Oof. It's like I was counting on it work. Or another one strung me along for months uh. for quite a bit of money and then ultimately just would never send me a contract and they just like folded up shop. Yikes, yikes. And it was like, Oh man. Yeah. So so there was stuff like that, um, and then a lot of publishers had pencil down orders as well. Um, I remember Matt Groom and I were writing Ultraman, mm -hmm. and I think we had, already we had already written issue one for sure. But I think we were, I think I'm pretty sure we had written issue two as well, and we wrote issues three through five in like record pace. Like right, right. we wrote. We wrote we wrote three issues in like a month because it, I I was looking at the situation going like we need to get these scripts in so that we can get paid um, in case there is a pencil pencil down order mm -hmm. and um, yeah I mean we didn't get it on Ultraman so we, we we did the book kept running and obviously it's come out Rise of Ultraman and now we're going into Trials of Ultraman yeah that's but, gotta feel good. <laughs> Yeah, it's that book. It, I'm really proud of it, and um, it's in really good shape right now. So that's a always a really good feeling to mm -hmm. know. Like we have a really cool plan. The team on it is awesome. Like we're just like making cool stuff now. Um, so, but but yeah, beyond that, there was quite a bit of kind of existential um, dread. You, you know, you could feel. I bet. Um, a lot of creators starting to kind of creators that previously had either dabbled in or hadn't really done creator owned suddenly were talking about creator owned, mm -hmm. um, and that also kind of coincided with everything that was going on at DC. I mean, there yes. were rumors about DC. Yeah, there were rumors about DC before um, the layoffs started happening there were rumors for quite a while i remember yeah there was some stuff coming up that wasn't going to be great and um i think you know amongst in the creative community a lot of creators had caught wind of that or um knew enough to to know like hey if that's happening like my exclusive contract isn't necessarily going to be guaranteed going mm. forward or Maybe I don't want to be exclusive here, you know. Um, and now DC just kind of isn't doing exclusive space. contracts anymore, right? That's something I never thought I would live to see. Well, I don't know about that, so I, I can't really speak to that. But oh, I, I think that's a new that like just happened. They said they're not going to be doing exclusives anymore. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'll, I'll I'll put it this way: I don't know where that I don't know where you read that or or where you heard that, but if. <laughs> There's no hard and fast rule with something like that because it, it really just comes down to market value. So like mm -hmm. if there's a creator, if there's a creator that is big enough and in demand enough, um, someone will give them an exclusive deal if they're amenable to it. See, this is why um, I love talking just, to you because you give us the you give us the real straight dough. This is what I love. This is the good shit right here. Well, it's, it's just like it's just supply and demand. Yeah. And like. 
there are only so many creators. Um, well, I should, I should qualify and say there are only so many creators who will move the needle um, in the market or, or at least have the potential to move the needle in the market. And those creators, I mean, I can count them on two hands probably, but those creators are um, incredibly valuable. It's like having... It's like having Patrick Mahomes or Deshaun Watson as your starting quarterback. There you go. Right now, <laughs> like, and I say this as a Bears fan, as a diehard Bears fan. <laughs> um, yeah, there's, there's th- those creators will always um, be prioritized and and have a, a safe landing spot if they so desire. Yeah, yeah. You, uh, you, we mentioned Ultraman there previously. What, what was that like? When did you get the call for that? When did that uh, really materialize? That's got to be a good story. Um, yeah, that came about. Um, came it, it, the 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 call came or the email came in like I want to say like October of 2019 from Tom Brevoort. I had just done a Winter Soldier miniseries for Tom and. Which was Tom wonderful. and I have known each other for 10 years. He was my very first editor in comics, actually, um, when I was 22, 23 years old. Um, I guess Tom had, you know, knew enough or knew that I had done Power Rangers. And I don't know that he had, you know, really necessarily read it, but I guess he had seen interviews. And, and I think we had also talked on the side about Kamen Rider at one point because... That was a, a franchise I hadn't gotten into, but I was interested in it. And Tom is actually a really big Kamen Rider fan. So really? I, I didn't know that. About, oh, yeah, he's a huge Kamen Rider guy. Huh. Um, he turned me on to Kamen Rider Build, which is the series that I'm 40 episodes in, into right now. And, and it's really my kind of like first proper Kamen Rider, like of a full series. And mm. I love it so great i still need to take the dive myself it's like doctor who it's like where do i begin oh yeah yeah no i I did that i I dipped in and then i dipped out um but i really liked the years that i was following it for um like all the matt smith stuff Mm. and a lot of the david Tennant as well Mm, likewise anyway um so tom just asked if i would have interest in this in, in Ultraman, and he's like, I know it would pigeonhole you as the kind of like Toku guy, but do you have interest? And I was like, Hey, I'm I don't mind being pigeonholed in something like that. It's a it's a genre or subgenre that I quite enjoy, um, and have been really taking a bit of pleasure in as I've gotten to know more about it. Um, and uh, you know, it makes a lot of sense coming off of Power Rangers and things like that, and so. We started kind of talking more seriously about it, and I asked if uh, if I could be a co-writer on it. It was it was Matt Groom who I knew through Power Rangers and self-made and just really believe in him. And Tom was totally open to it, and so we worked up this pitch. And while that was going on, I was also building Radiant Black. Mm, so yes. it kind of just turned into like a little bit of a happy coincidence that. They were both happening in the background, and then we announced Ultraman at C2E2 basically a year ago now, mm. about 11 months ago. Back when we could still go to cons. <laughs> uh-huh. And the response, the reaction was incredible. Like, it was very overwhelming. Um, and I remember then talking to Image afterwards going like, hey, this Radiant Black... Um, which I'd already been building. Just looking at it from a scheduling standpoint, it was like, oh, this could uh, this could work out decently here because it'll come out right after Ultraman, and that's kind of what's exactly what's happened. Um, you know, Ultraman started coming out in October, and Radiant Black will start now in February, and um, the initial returns on the Radiant Black orders have been very positive and mm-hmm. building kind of a big digital presence for the, the book. And uh, yeah, it's just been a, 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 a nice little ride the last uh, year and a half, I guess, as yeah. we've been building, uh, building everything. 
Absolutely, yeah. I uh, I got a chance to read uh, Radiant Black uh, early. We're recording yeah. this on Saturday night. The book comes out Wednesday the 10th. Uh, my review will be dropping Monday about it, so I'm really dying to talk to you about it, but I also don't want to spoil <laughs> too much because I want people to go out and get the book Uh right away right. one of the funniest things and i actually bring this up in the video review uh that people have had a chance to see by now this is the only time ever with radiant black that i got not one but two press copies i got one from image and then one from <laughs> you and your people too and i'm like man they must really think i'm an easy lay for this book and they were right i was <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah i don't i don't know about that but um i'm glad you enjoyed it that's the that's the priority so so, yeah, I mean, uh, Radiant Black just feels very personal. Would I be correct in saying that? Obviously, you know, the main character uh, ends up moving back to Illinois and everything, you know, is a creative person with creative endeavors and everything. Definitely struck a chord with me, and I'm sure a lot of people like me, where it's like, oh, this is this is our story that Kyle is telling here, right. basically. We've all been this guy. Yeah, I mean, it's as much me writing about my own fears as it is bits of my own life experience as well. Um, I, <clears throat> the way I describe the book is that it's not about me, but there's a lot of me in the book. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of by design to be totally honest. Um, I looked at the opportunity when the opportunity came up to build an original superhero. I was, kind of all in from the get-go. And I had been toying around with this idea of Radiant Black from a, um, and, and by idea, I mean it was very different. Uh, and I may still do it one day, but um, it was a very different era, more dystopian. Mm. Um, I had the, the iconography of the black holes and as power sources mm -hmm. uh, was the same. The, the name was the same. And suddenly I was going like, oh, well, all that stuff could be really cool as a contemporary superhero series. And I take what I'm kind of, what I just enjoyed doing and building in, in the Power Rangers kind of mold. And I was starting to get into kind of the tokusatsu uh, genre and, and learning more about it. I was like, oh, well, if I take those influences and some of my Nightwing influences and and just kind of everything about me as a writer. And, um, and I tell that kind of superhero story, but right now, and, you know, a few years ago after a really bad breakup, I ended up back home for a couple months. Um, not for the same reasons as Nathan, but, you know, yeah. I, was, I was back in my hometown for a few months, staying with my parents. And, and you know, and, you know, I have debt as well. And, and so it's just like, oh, there's a lot here that feels really personal mm -hmm. in a way that I think could be relatable. And if this is as big enough as I think it is, um, and this is, you know, so many things in my life have, have ultimately circled back to center on superheroes. Mm -hmm. When I was in college and I was getting ready to make my senior thesis film or figure out what I was going to make, to go pursue this thing that I wanted to do my entire life, I decided, hey, I should make a superhero movie because superheroes are how I found cinema in the first place. Mm. And and so it was like, well, let's go back to the material that kind of inspired me from the get-go. And now, 10 years into doing comics full-time, I don't really keep up with um, mainstream superhero books. It's um, hard. passing that much. <laughs> yeah, I have a passing knowledge of what's going on, but like, I'm not a fan of them anymore. Um, it's it's hard, um, with with very rare kind of few exceptions, right? And suddenly, I'm going. I want to do something else as a as a as a writer and something to really like plant my flag in the sand. And um, the second that the possibility of doing something that was a new superhero came up, it was like. Yeah, of course. That's exactly what I want to do because I love superheroes. Hell yeah! And so it's 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 this strange push and pull, um, but I did feel strongly that like I had something interesting and and, and hopefully hopefully interesting um, to say here with this book and some stuff to explore, 
Um, and so I, I just kind of felt like uh, building a foundation that was personal was a way to uh, ensure that if, uh, you know, knock on wood, if this book works and keeps going for a long time, it's a book that I'll always want to write. Oh, because it can kind of change as I change, basically. That sounds amazing. <laughs> that sounds like something I, of course, would be very interested in reading. Let's let, let's talk about the design process here, because you know sure. you had mentioned this elsewhere before. The design of Radiant Black, obviously, there's a lot of Power Rangers in there, a little Nightwing, a little Spider Man, just all these really cool references. You know, when it comes to designing something like this, you know what. Uh, I, I, I mean, I guess, was it always your intention to be like, mm, I need to make something instantly iconic, something that is both, you know, simple, but something that works in, like, profile and, like, uh, shadow, too, even? Um, kind of, yeah. I mean, since I had the name and the iconography for a different interpretation of this idea, um, before it was going to be a you know, straight superhero thing. Mm -hmm. I wasn't thinking so much about the kind of superhero or the kind of suit, the henshin mm -hmm. transformation design uh, until the whole concept flipped into, well, do you want to create an original superhero? I was like, yeah, I would do that. So then it became like, okay, if I'm doing that, it's contemporary and it's right now, what does that look like? I had the name. I knew it was Miniature Black Hole. Um, and so it became this process of, of working with Marcelo to, to figure out, like, well, what is this? Like, I don't, this isn't Power Rangers, mm. you know, but what are the tenets of Tokusatsu? What are the tenets of Western superhero kind of design? And I, you know, we, we experimented with some different kind of, for example, some different kind of helmet shapes and yeah, designs. Yeah. And pretty quickly I felt like, oh, you know what? No, I, I want the I want the I want the motorcycle helmet look. Like I want the kind of Sentai common rider it's a good perfect look. oval look. Yeah, I was like, you know what, I want to do that. And then even and then I, I, I recognized it was like I want there was one version of a design he did that's close to what the final um, shapes of the helmet are. I was like, no, 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 that with, with the solid black glass, dark black. Mm. Uh, and I said, but here's what we're going to do. I was like, we need to do Spider-Man eyes. Like they need to be energy manifestations because I had just written three years of Power Rangers yeah. where you, you know, at least in live action, you have a voice. Yeah. In, yeah. In comics, you have that. It's just like visor after visor. Like how do you emote? Um, and so I was like, uh, let's do like energy eyes so we can get some Spider-Man kind of expressiveness. Mm -hmm. And so that shored up pretty quickly. And also my favorite color scheme of all time is black, red, and white. Mm, goes like with it's everything. Nightwing, it's the Carolina paint. It's like, so the fact that he was called Radiant Black, like I made it kind of personal choice early on where I was like, put you know, because we're going to have to color tint his powers. Can we kind of, can we tint him out like midnight blue, mm -hmm. getting into light blues? So it got me the color palette that I love from Nightwing as well. Um, and then the body of the suit, that was the thing that it, it didn't take very long to figure out, but it did change the most drastically, including the emblem. Um, and the, the first ones were fine that Marcelo did, but they just kind of felt they didn't nothing about them really kind of stood out. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, he, he did like a series of four different kind of variations off the same idea. And, um, and I, I was like, well, you know, I comped a few things. Um, I don't even remember the specific references, but, uh, I brought up, I was like, look, you know, the, the Invincible comics make a joke about this, but it really is true. Like, you want iconic. Like, we yeah. want something that reads from across the room. Something that, that works in looks, silhouette. Yeah, that, well, that's tougher to do on something like Rating Black because that's Power Rangers silhouette as well. True enough, um, yeah. <laughs> but, um, 
but yeah, to, to that point, like the spirit of your, your point there, absolutely. Like I remember showing this costume design to Declan Shelby and he was like, oh, that's great. He's like, look, you can make it really tiny and it, it an inch small and you can still, it still reads. And he was pointing out, he's like, because the face was solid black, but the eyes, and he's like, a lot of people want to add more details in that. Yes. It just ends up being the design. And so the stripped down simplicity of the design yes, I think yes. also has made it um, just really um, easy to translate. And, and so, like, we're seeing a lot of fan art already. And yeah, I noticed. Top. It's pretty cool. Yeah, I, I think so. people were really quite hungry for a design like this because, you know, a complaint I always have and other YouTubers have when it comes to this kind of thing where it's like so many of the new designs, heroes or villains right now, they're all over designed to hell. Nothing is sleek or minimalist anymore. And that's a real shame because you look at like, you know, the costumes that live forever you know, in the halls of fandom and everything, a lot of them are incredibly simple. Uh, I, I was actually reminded of a great interview the uh, art director for uh, the God of War games did, and he said, look, you know, when we created Kratos, he had armor and spikes and all this other stuff, and I was the one who said, well, just keep taking stuff away. Take as much away as you can while still having that character be that character. And I'm like, that's a very smart lesson to learn in the world of art and character creation that more people should learn. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I agree with that. Yeah, And uh, we definitely have that uh, all over the place. And now, uh, when it comes with picking a name, too, for your big new premiere hero, did you do a lot of name research and everything? Because, again, I bring this up in my review. It's like, oh, Burnett, that actually has an interesting history when you trace that back. And, oh, when you put the name together, that almost becomes something. Which, which, when you put which name together? Uh, uh, Burnett, uh, in my research there, it's a, what is it, a French corruption of a Scottish word? It was a nickname <laughs> they gave to people who dyed stuff. Dyed stuff darker shades. He is a darker shade. Oh. He is the radiant black. That's, um, yeah, I wish I could take credit for that. That's, like, that's cool. Oh, really? Is that, uh, is that just a beautiful mistake? <laughs> yeah, no, it's, that's not something I was aware of. No. Hey, that's, that's not a mistake, then. That's fate. By all means, you run with that <laughs> in every interview after this. No one has to know that. No, the name, um, well, the name Nathan and his other friend Marshall um, comes from a few different places. One... I just like the sound of Nathan as a, as a character name. Um, there was someone I went to school with from, uh, well, definitely in junior high named Nathan. And I always kind of just liked that name. Mm. And so my friend, there's a friend of mine in LA named Nathan as well. Uh, and then I have another friend named Marshall, but I played a, they're not their respective personalities right. of the characters. Right. But it, it's just funny because they're, they are kind of both friends of mine out here. Um, but I just liked, I didn't name the characters because of them, but I mm. like, I liked the names as a result of uh, like, and how they're not each of these it yeah, yeah. was kind of fun for me. Um, and then Burnett comes from, uh, Alan Burnett, oh. my favorite my favorite writers. Okay, see, I was going to say that, too, because with a name like Burnett, it's either a Carol Burnett reference or an Alan Burnett reference who was involved in no, so Alan. many of the shows we all loved growing up. Yep. Yeah, yeah, that's where that, that's where that one comes from. That's really good. Cool. Does he know that? Does he know that uh, the character is named for him? No, I haven't seen Alan in a couple years. Um, so the last time I saw him, I was still writing Power Rangers, so I wasn't working on this yet or anything like that, but... And uh, Na um, Nathan, yeah. too, that's uh, that's an old Hebrew name, which means to give. So when you put Nathan Burnett together, it literally means to give a darker shade. <laughs> well, I mean, I, you know, I um, it's funny because uh, eighth grade Kyle would be rolling his eyes right now. Uh, and 35 year old Kyle's going like, well, yeah, hey, like, you know, if that's, if that's what it meant, means, that's what it means, you know, you can read whatever <laughs> meaning you want, and 13-year-old uh, Kyle's going, no, there is no hidden meaning, what are you talking about? <laughs> That's um, that's always been a I, weird thing for me to always research names, like, no, names always mean something, even if they don't think it means something. <laughs> well, what I, I can tell you, I, I've really fallen in love with the push and pull 
um, in the name Radiant Black. Like there's tension between those two words. Mm. Like just just from an optics, from a light standpoint, like you don't typically think like, you know, in, in terms of um, light and shadow, like typically you think, you know, black is like the absence of light. So for it to be radiant, like how does that work? Does it look negative? Like what is what, you know, I just, I just like that um, kind of contradiction in, in, in uh, what we, we think of as far as kind of terms. Um, Feels good too, and rolls off the tongue. What's that? I said it feels good too. Rolls off the tongue, radiant black. It's got a good tongue feel to it. Yeah, I I uh, I don't hate it. <laughs> I'll say <laughs> that I don't hate it. So, and how how he gets that name is actually really fun. Um, that'll be something that comes. Um, it's not an issue one. It's yes, that's up. right. It isn't. <laughs> no, it's not. I. Uh, it's a fun. It's a really fun scene. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I appreciated uh, that there was a character named Marshall in this, too, because literally my best friend growing up in grade school was also named Marshall. I don't know whatever happened to him, but I thought that was fun and interesting. Also, how Marshall is that guy who stayed in the small town and everything keeps saying, hey, man, it's really happening, you know, uh, it's totally different since you left. I've been that guy and know that guy. So that was another thing that struck a chord with me. <laughs> Yeah, well, and that's actually that's my hometown too, where they, where they're at. So it's it's extra weird for me. <laughs> to I see bet. In the beach issue. Now uh, another one of the fun uh, kind of rumors circulating a uh, radiant black, and maybe one of the other reasons that it's you know really kind of caught on the way it does. And you know again, you know feel free to answer this one or you know uh, dance around if you like. A lot of people are saying that you know this book could very well be the start of a brand new uh, interconnected shared universe for Image Heroes. And in fact, if you pick up number one of Radiant Black, you may actually see some familiar Image faces in the background of one of the scenes here. Can uh, can we speak to that at all, or are we keeping uh, that one under wraps for the time being? I mean, it'd be cool. Sure would. <laughs> Especially now, I think it would be pretty damn cool, wouldn't it? I think, I mean, I'm, I mean... Obviously, I'm biased because <laughs> I write pretty black, but I think it'd be um, I think it'd be pretty cool. Uh, I also think that um, it could be a lot of fun. No doubt about it. Especially considering like what you know, I, I, I had I had a fun time uh, when I was doing Power Rangers, um, building out in a really um, grand way mm -hmm. was, uh, was something that I, I did, I did, uh, I did quite enjoy. So, um, yeah, if something like that were to happen, um, what's even more fun about it is the fact that, um, every creator would own everything that they create. Yeah, you, know, but... you have to be smart. You, you would have to be smart about stuff like that. Mm -hmm. You know, um, but um, but yeah, could be uh, could be really cool. I guess that's what I'll. I guess that's what I would say about <laughs> so, the topic in general. So stay tuned, everyone. Is what we're saying. Stay tuned. Uh, again, you uh, you. you... Yeah. Yeah. I, I would say this, if you like superheroes and you like image comics, well, hey, Radiant Black is about to come out, so you might as well pick it up. Oh, boy. Because it is both superheroes and it's published at Image Comics. So uh, at the very least, if you like image superheroes, uh, Radiant Black would be a really great first place to start. You heard the man, everybody. Uh, you mentioned Power Rangers earlier, of course. Uh, one of the other great things I really liked about Radiant Black, number one, is that when you're done the comic, you actually wrote, like, a big, big, like, almost, like, editorial piece, you know, talking about the book and everything and how you came to it. And you talk about your own history with Toku and Sentai and Power Rangers. And, again, that, like, you know, that, that, that like, stuff just touched me, like, right in the heart. Because, again, you're basically telling my story, too. You loved the show. You kept with it long after all your friends quit. I, I also taped it. That was my thing, too. I always hated it because my bus was, like, I was the last one to get dropped off every day. And when Power Rangers aired during the week, yes, kids, this show aired new episodes during the week. I would always miss, like, the first 15 minutes, and I'd always have to play catch-up. Yeah, yeah. So that was a heck of a thing. And, you know, what, uh, 
you know, are we going to see more of that uh, in the future? Are we going to see more, you know, kind of like personal writings uh, like that here for the back of the comic? Uh, are we doing like a oh. Q and A uh, stuff, there? <laughs> an ask? Well, <laughs> well, we'll we'll do a letters column um, every month for sure. But um, one of the things that is important to me is finding really fun ways to utilize that back matter space, um, both to tease other cool projects, mm -hmm. uh, but also to build out the Radiant Black kind of world. Uh, and then on top of that, um, just to like, sometimes just to give a really cool kind of spotlight to a creator or an idea or a story that I just think is really awesome. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna kind of do all of that in the back matter. Um, I love it. So much of like what you're talking about, like the article that I wrote, is, is is really just to provide context for why I think it's cool to basically create a a space where we can do and celebrate just like really cool stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and and so you know we'll have articles about toy collecting. Um, Ooh. I'm talking to a, a, a film journalist who, whose work I love nice. about doing, you know, an article about, you know, Raymond Chandler cinema. <laughs> oh. um, and uh, one, once you read issue one, that'll make more sense. But um, yeah, so just kind of using it as a way to like do stuff that, um, that I just think is really fun and neat and gets me excited just to think about like, Oh, that we're going to, we can make that like, cause that didn't exist before. Mm -hmm. um, so as far as like diving into like I don't know like old childhood stories and stuff like that, like I probably won't uh, very often just because there's no reason to. Right, right. <laughs> but um, I guess if there's a if there's a question that warrants it um, in the letters column, like maybe I'll take a tangent. Can only bear your soul uh, so much at a time. I get it. <laughs> I understand. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, you uh, you mentioned other uh, projects there too. Obviously, Radiant Black uh, drops uh, today when this video goes up and when people are watching it. But uh, you got anything else in the hop or anything else you're excited about? Anything you can talk about even? Uh, uh, well, nothing I can really talk about. But yeah, I have, I have a I have a ton of stuff going on. Um, I, I mean, I'm writing I'm writing a lot of books right now. Um, number of creator own books and then uh, a couple work for hire books um, Ultraman nice. is really really picking up uh, steam here and then uh, yeah I've got some stuff on the film side um, the, the non comic book side of my life uh, yes because you do more director. than just comics yeah yeah so there's some cool stuff going on there that uh, hopefully will be announced um, in the next couple months um, but they're, they're, we're like waiting on a few things, um, which is infuriating I considering bet. all the pieces we already have in place. So, yeah. Uh, yeah so staying busy, um, but uh, the priority is, is certainly first and foremost. Um, and then also, actually, this big Kickstarter book that we did last year, and we're about um, 50 pages through the um, the 100 page. Uh, or 120 page graphic novel so it's called the trap a uh, big sci-fi uh, story yeah, yeah so um yeah actually um we just launched a newsletter as well called kyle higgins black market news so if you go to radiant.black slash newsletter you can sign up there so that's kind of the spot to go for um we're gonna be announcing some stuff there we'll have like limit some limited edition items that will be surprise dropping there as oh well cool yeah. Oh, I love that. That's absolutely wicked. Well, uh, we're almost at the 40 minute mark now. Again, thank you so much, Kyle, for making this happen tonight oh, and coming to talk with us. It's always a pleasure again. So nice to get you back all this time later. Like I said, Kyle was one of the first comic people to actually talk with me. So for him to come back now when I have my own show and my own channel and doing my own thing feels really Strange, really dude. nice absolutely and again uh thank you too for allowing me to actually give away two copies uh digital copies sure. of radiant black there uh we're going to be doing that this episode 
I haven't figured out what contest we're going to do yet because I'm recording this before I record the other thing, but we'll figure it out. And when we do, we'll give away the first one this week and we'll give away the next one next week. So be sure to awesome. keep your eyes peeled for that, everyone. So thank you so much, Kyle. Again, where can people check you out uh, right now and where can they go for uh, all their Radiant Black news? Just social media is fine at Kyle D. Higgins or um, just our website is just radiant.black. So if you just go to radiant.black, you can see all the all the latest and you can pre-order the book or even just purchase the book outright um, through some different links on the site. So. Wonderful. So everyone be sure to go and do that. And that'll just about do it for us, everyone, for another episode of the Comic Multiverse. Thank you so much for watching and listening. And we will be back again next week. And again, Kyle, the door is always open if you have something to promote or even just want to come by and chat. You are more than welcome, oh, sir. Oh, sure, man. All right, then. Awesome. <laughs> ah, we absolutely will. Bye-bye, everyone.